Good morning. Welcome to the Bar of Sunday Morning Services. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Thank you so much for being with me. You can get involved with what's happening now by calling the phone number on the screen there or, or emailing us, uh, and we can answer your questions or comments today as it is happening. Uh, good morning again, everybody. Good morning, sir. Hi, y'all. Good, good. Um, I have a very interesting, good speaker for you. This year, we are building a solid foundation. That's our theme for this year. Everybody remember that? Yeah. Is anybody foundation being built yet? Is it? <laughs> is this, uh, feel, do you feel a little stronger and wiser? Oh, good. Only three people. What God said, I came for one. Uh, four. Okay, four people. Well, that's good. Uh, so we are building this foundation. So this year, we're going to have good speakers for you that will help build this spiritual foundation because I've come to realize that America is weak because the family is weak, the foundation is weak, that guys talk about. We have to build our house on a solid foundation. Uh, Dave Anderson is president of Learn to Lead, uh, and he is our guest speaker for today. Dave is the author of 12 books, including How to Run Your Business by the Book and How to Lead by the Book. He, author, he authors a monthly leadership column for two national magazines, and his interviews and articles have appeared in hundreds of publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Investors Business uh, Daily, and U.S. U.S. News and World Report. He is a frequent panelist on MSNBC's Your Business um, Show. Dave' wife is here too. Is she here? Oh, hi. That's Dave' wife. Hi, wife Rhonda. I'm glad you made it, wife. Are you are you the daughter? And your daughter's here. Ashley is here. Ashley is the head of the uh, foundation that they run. And the, um, the foundation is uh, Matthews 2535 Foundation, whose mission is to bring food, housing, clothing, healing, and Christ to under-resourced and imprisoned people worldwide. And I want to tell you in advance that they have been a great help to us here at Bond with, with our uh, um, private school, Bond Leadership Academy, also with our home for young men. So I really, really appreciate them. And Dave, your subject is red, red belt mentality. Is that right? Yes, Come sir. on down. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Peter. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. We will get to that in due time. It's very nice to be with you. And there is some water if you want water. There. Thank you very much. I want to talk about how to stay hungry for God with a red belt mentality. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, red belt mindset. It's a martial arts term. I find it a, applies very well to many things in life. I will give you a little background on how I learned about the term and then talk about how we can develop a stronger hunger and develop that mindset that keeps us hungrier for God. I didn't get into the martial arts until my 40s and I remember one of the first days uh, in the studio the instructor pointed to a wall and there were 12 belts on the wall and they were all on a very nice plaque from white belt to black belt and those were the 12 belts that we would have to go through to become a black belt in our style. And he pointed to the red belt, looks just like this one here. And this was the one right next to the black belt. And he said, do you see that red belt? I said, well, yes. He said, well, let me tell you something. He said, the red belts are the most dangerous fighters in this studio or anywhere else you're likely to go and spar. And I was a little confused by that because I'm looking at the black belt. And I'm thinking, well, isn't that the point? Isn't that the objective to become a black belt? And he said, don't get me wrong. He said, we have some outstanding black belt fighters here. But he said, but let me tell you what happens. He said, very often, somebody passes their black belt test and they start to get this idea that now they have arrived. Okay, now they've kind of a know-it-all. Even though there are 10 degrees, there's decades more that you can learn. 
And so the number one thing most black belts do when they pass that test is they start putting on weight because they're not working as hard. They're not training as hard. He said, I've seen people pass the test and they don't come back to the studio for months. And when they do, they're really not working hard. They're walking around with their thumbs in their belt tubes like they're Jackie Chan giving advice to people. He said, but, he said, but the red belts, he said, they're still hungry. They know they haven't arrived. They've got this sense of urgency, this intensity. They, they're training hard. They're coachable. They're teachable. He said they kind of have a chip on their shoulder, some of them, because they got to feel like they got to prove themselves. He said, I've seen more hungry red belts, knock down or knock out complacent black belts. He said, here's the lesson I want you to get. He said, if you ever become a black belt, continue to think like a red. He said, act like a challenger, even if you're the champ. He said, Challengers are hungry and they're humble and they're teachable. They have something to prove. Champs can get cocky and complacent and start to lose their edge. They can turn into know-it-alls. And of course, as he's telling me this, I'm understanding the martial arts aspect of it, but I'm a businessman, so I'm also starting to see the business aspect of it. That sometimes in business, and it happened to me and it happens to many of the people we work with, they start to get successful and they lose some of that hunger that they once had earlier on. And, and they start to maintain things rather than stretch them. They stop learning new things. They keep borrowing credibility from who they were, what they did once upon a time. And they, they become complacent. And so I wrote an article for a business magazine called Stay Hungry with a Red Belt Mindset. And it got a lot of publications in a lot of different places. Uh, the president of Ford Canada saw the article and he called me up and he said, Dave, he said, uh, I like that article. He said, can you turn that article into a speech? And I said, well, sir, for the right amount of money, I'll turn the yellow pages into a speech. What would you like exactly? <laughs> and he said, well, he said, let me tell you my situation. He said, up here in Canada, he said, General Motors has been the number one brand for 50 years. He said, for the last two years, we've knocked them out. It's been Ford. He said, and my dealers are starting to get complacent. And so I want them to hear this get hungry, stay hungry message. And so I did a series of talks. The most fun one was in Detroit. They had 900 dealers there. And at the end of it, they gave them each a red belt. So they could go and they could put this back on their desk, under credenza, somewhere where they could see it on a daily basis. Just to remind them, stay hungry. You haven't arrived yet. You're, you, you must remain teachable and humble and don't turn into a cocky, complacent know-it-all. And as a leader, I think there's so many applications to this. We, we see it in our families. Uh, it, when you're a leader in your family and you lose that hunger for God, it, what, what we find in leadership is when the leader lets up a little, the, the rest of the group lets up a lot. That's the penalty. When, when, when you, if you're a leader, when, when you catch cold, the followers tend to come down with pneumonia. All right, and, and so you're having a little let up here and all of a sudden, you know, you're not talking about God, you're not studying God, you're not living according to God's ways, it starts to get picked up on by the rest of your family. Or if you're in a business, it's the same thing. Complacency can attack us spiritually, it can attack us financially, it can attack us physically. You know, if you look up the word complacent, it says calmly content, smugly self-satisfied. Think about that. Calmly content, smugly self-satisfied. When do we get into a complacent state? Normally, it's when things are going fairly well and we're calmly content, we're smugly self-satisfied. If you look at the word hunger and you look it up, it's an intense desire, a compelling craving. Not just a desire, not just a craving. Would you agree with me? If something's intense and compelling, it moves you. It moves you. And so when we start to lose that, that, that's something that moves us as a leader. Normally it means that complacency has come along and started to snuff out that intense desire and that compelling craving. And if you've lost your hunger for God, you've got to get it back. And if you have it, your challenge is to sustain it, not to allow this complacency to come along and to snuff it out. You know, it's interesting when you study hunger, what, what people say, well, what really triggers it? Because honestly, no one can make you hungry. Now, hunger is an inside job. Does that make sense? It's an inside job. I mean, as a leader, here's what I've learned in the workplace. If I gotta, if I gotta give somebody a pep talk every day, you know, if I got someone who's just not hungry, and every day I gotta hug them and burp them and nurse them and coddle them and wind them up and give them a pep talk, why? 
That's just exhausting. You ever have anybody like that on your team? I mean, wouldn't you rather have to slow people down a little bit than wind them up every day? I'd much rather like, whoa, slow down. Let's talk about this a minute, right? I would rather have to calm down a geyser than motivate a mud hole. Personally, that would be my preference. So no one can make you hungry. You've got to figure it out. It comes from the inside out. Now, sometimes someone has a fire and it goes down to a flame and it's a flicker and pretty soon maybe it's just embers. Well, we can try to stoke the embers in someone, right? That's called motivation. We can try to stoke those embers and get the fire back, but my contention is you can't put the embers inside of anyone and nor can anyone put them in you. You've got to figure this out. And, and so people say, well, where does it come from then? Well, you know, I really believe that hunger, hunger comes from your reasons. The why, the W-H-Y. Perhaps you've heard speakers talk about the power of the why, W-H-Y. You know what I mean by that? Your why is your reasons. Here's why I'm working so hard. Here's why I'm starting so early. Here's why I'm going so late. Here's why I no longer hang around with that group of people. Here's why I'm watching less television and reading more books. Here's why I'm developing the knowledge, the habit, the discipline, because I want to accomplish this, this, and that. I, I want my kids to go to this school. I want to move out of this house and into that one. I want to make a difference for my church or for this cause here or there. And I'll tell you, you lose your way when you lose your why. And, and, and as we start to get satisfied in certain areas of our life, and one of them is our relationship with God, we start to lose that hunger. We can develop this very complacent, casual relationship with God where we're skimming the surface, where we're really no longer shaping the culture around us, but it's shaping us. We're making compromises with culture and have lost that hunger to do something great for God. And so, you know, to, to have this red belt type of mentality, we, we need to reevaluate our reasons. Our reasons in every area of our life, but it, especially our reasons for doing what we do for God. Hudson Taylor, the incredible missionary, he, used to, he said this, he said, I used to pray that God would do something for me. Then I would ask if I could do something for him. He said, then I prayed that he would do his work through me. And I really think that's where hunger progresses, not just to ask God for things, not just to ask what can we do, but God, I'm hungry for you. I want, I want more of your impact work through me. And in fact, I want to share three phases of hunger for God and kind of see which one you're in most of the time. And if you're not where you want to be, give you some ideas for stirring it back up. God is too great and incredible to go through life with this skim the surface, casual type of relationship. The first, I, and by the way, all three of these are driven by desires. I think desire drives hunger. Your why. The first is what I call desire for delivery. That's the first thing that makes us hungry for God. We want Him to deliver something to us. Desire for delivery. God, I, it may be something as basic as our daily bread. I got to eat. Okay. That, that makes us hungry for God. Would you agree you need something? You go to God. Or maybe a promotion, it may be a job. God, God, I need the house to come, the house loan to come through. I need to, to pay the bill. I have, um, I, I'm trying to get this big deal, Lord. And, and so this, this is one form of hunger for God. And, and sometimes it's like, Lord, just, uh, I really need to win this lottery, you know. If you could just guide me to pick those right numbers. And by the way, if the Cowboys could just beat the Redskins, Lord, really. And I don't know, you probably know this, God, but the, but the spread, you probably know the spread. It's... It's seven. I mean, that's a good biblical number, God. If you could just help me out a little bit there, you know. And then so we, we, ha we have this desire uh, for delivery. And, that, and, and but if that's all your relationship with God is, you're, you're going you're gonna to treat him like some type of cosmic bellboy to where you're only calling on him when you need something. Now, the, the, the second type of desire is desire for deliverance. Okay, deliver, get us out of something. Okay, so the first is deliver something to me. The second is get me out of something. It might be deliverance from an addiction. It might be deliverance from an unpleasant situation. It could be deliverance from an unhealthy relationship. It could be deliver. I do not want to have uh, Thanksgiving with, with those in-laws this, this, this year, Lord. Could you please deliver us from that and into something a little bit more pleasant? But it, it is a form of hunger. And, and it's similar to delivery. And we're not asking for something. We're asking to get out of something. Now, Either of those, nothing wrong with some of that. God tells us, you know, you have not, in James it says, you have not because you ask not. 
He wants us to come to Him for things. In 1 Peter 5, 7, it says that cast all of your cares and anxieties on Him. So I'm not knocking those things. What I'm saying is if that's the level of our hunger for God, we're never going to be, as Hudson Taylor prayed, really used by God in a significant way. He's going to be very limited as to how He can work through us and how we can advance His kingdom in our own little world, whether it's in our family, in our business, in our community, in the country. See, the third type of desire is the desire to make a difference. So we have a desire for delivery, a desire for deliverance, and a desire really for a difference. And I think that when we start to get to this level, our hunger for God intensifies because somewhere along the line we start to realize there's only so much we can do on our own with our own power and our own wisdom. And if we take this limited life that we have and we really want to do something significant with it, and if you're in any type of leadership position, I speak mainly to leadership groups, but here's what I've come to believe about leadership. It's not about titles. It's about performance. You know, if I'm using the word leader in here and you're thinking, well, I'm really not in a leadership position, I, listen, don't get hung up on titles. A title has never made anybody a leader. All a title does is give you a chance to become one. It buys you an opportunity to earn influence or to lose it, to get the job done or to blow it. It's a foolish notion to be thinking somehow you've been made more competent by virtue of a change in title. We've also all seen people who have no title whatsoever, but they're leaders. They have influence. They're the go-to people. They make things happen. They have character and competence. And so as we're leading, all of us are leaders. As we're leading our own lives, leading our own families, and we really want to take it up a notch and do something more significant for God, we have to understand that it's going to require this third level of desire. This has to become part of our why. Not just bring me this, not just get me out of that, but I want to do this. In fact, Lord, do it through me to advance your kingdom. It's really the highest level of why. I think there are three phases that we go through to really make a difference for God. The first phase is, again, we're going to start basic and work up. First, you have to believe in Him. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the first phase. If you don't believe in God, obviously He can't do much through you in most cases. The second is, believe Him. Okay, so see, would you agree with me that believing in Him and believing what He says are often two different things? Just look the way most Christians live their lives. Yeah, I believe in God, but I, I don't act in the way that He says I should act. And so we have to progress to stir up this hunger, to get this red belt mindset working. We have to progress from just, yes, believing in Him to actually believing Him. And, and but that we don't stop there, but we, we, we must go there. Not just that He's God, but that His Word makes sense. You see that when we read in Matthew 5 and he tells us that we shouldn't lust and commit adultery, that we realize that makes sense. That's a sensible law to live by. Or we go up to Matthew 18 and he talks about forgiveness and the penalties of not forgiving and being turned over to your tormentors. And we realize, you know what? That's good advice. I believe that. That sounds sound. Doesn't mean I'm going to do it yet, but I agree that it sounds sound. Or we look at Matthew 19 and he talks about how marriage should be between a man and a woman, and we think, well, that should be fairly obvious because if civilization is to continue, that, that would kind of need to be the model, right? Or, or we go to uh, Matthew 23, and he says, you should not leave tithing undone. And you think, well, that sounds fair. Everything belongs to God anyway, so giving the first fruits of my income back uh, should certainly be a reasonable expectation to honor God first. Or we go to Mark 7, and it talks against fornication and sexual immorality, and we think, well, you know what? I can see where that would protect me physically, that would protect me spiritually, that would protect my soul. I'm believing this. This sounds like a sound way to live. Or we go to Luke 18 and he says, let the children come unto me and do not hinder them. And we start to understand that doesn't just mean the children that are alive today, but even the children that haven't been born, they should be allowed to come into God and that we should not hinder that process. That sounds like it's worth doing. It certainly protects the sanctity of life. And so, yes, now I believe in him. I also believe Him, but that's still not enough. It's still not enough to generate that hunger to a point to where He can really use you because let's face it, everything I just mentioned is in the Bible. The devil knows what's in the Bible. The devil can quote Scripture. And the devil probably would think that's a pretty good way to do it. He just doesn't want to do it doesn't, and doesn't want you to do it, wants to keep you from doing it. And so to really get to the third stage of hunger, we have to understand 
it's going to require obedience. We have to go from believing in Him to, yes, believing Him and then obeying what He says. And I believe that there are huge rewards for obedience. That's where the hunger gets stirred up because when you become obedient to God's Word, He reveals Himself to you. He shows you His will. He gives you more opportunities, which makes you even hungrier for Him and the desire to be even more obedient. And it just creates this incredible cycle. You know, John 13, 17 says, If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. You'll notice that knowing them isn't blessable. Just the fact that you know the commandments, just the fact that you know what you're supposed to do, just the fact that you know what God says about a particular area, that's not enough. According to the Scripture, that's not even blessed. What's blessed is doing it. In, in John 14, 21, Jesus says... If you, the person that loves me is the one that keeps my commandments. Doesn't just know them. He has them and he keeps them. And he says, to that person, I'm going to manifest myself. You want more of God? You, you, maybe you haven't been hearing much from him. Maybe you've lost some of that hunger because you say, well, you know what? I, I just don't hear God's voice anymore. I don't hear him speaking to him anymore. Could it be because you haven't listened to the last 10 things he told you? Maybe he's not ready to tell you anything else. Maybe He's ready for us to do our part and just start obeying. And then as we obey, the Scripture says He will manifest Himself to us. He will show up in your life. He will show Himself to you. He'll reveal more of His will to you. And I believe that starts that cycle. Because when He reveals more of His will and you see your role in it, you see how He can use you. That draws you closer to Him and makes you want to be more obedient. And then as you're more obedient, He reveals even more to you and gives you more territory and more opportunities, and that brings you even closer. But the hunger starts with obedience, not just believing in, not just believing, but closing that gap between knowing and doing. It's a cycle of virtue. Now, if you're in a leadership position, an official position, the stakes are even higher. Because as I said earlier, if you let up a little, others let up a lot. If you catch cold, they get pneumonia. That is so very true. In fact, in Luke 12, 48, it says, To whom much is given, much is required. I believe that really speaks to leaders. To where if you know better, you know there's even higher stakes if you don't do it. It says earlier in that verse that if you don't know any better and you don't do it, you're beat with a few stripes. But if you know better and you don't do it, you're beat with many stripes. And I think that really ought to speak to leaders. So it's whatever you're leading, and it may just simply be something as, as, as wonderful as your own life. I got to tell you, coming to church an hour a week is a wonderful start. But if that's all we're doing, if that's all we're doing is tipping God with an hour of our time each week, learning a little bit more about Him, and the last thing most of us need to do, to do is learn more things we're not going to go back and follow. We're not even following the things we know. And so if that's the level of our hunger, it's going to be very superficial. God's going to be able to uh, do very little through you of significance for His kingdom. But that's the blessings of obedience. He shows Himself to us. And if you're in a leadership position, it really shouldn't be an option. I suggest as our time winds down here that you seriously consider, and I just really think we should all look in the mirror often and do a spiritual audit for complacency. Think about the things that maybe you know but you're not doing. We all get off track. That's not the point. We're not perfect people. But the fact is, as we grow in Christ, we should be focusing on two things. Number one, getting off track less often. Wouldn't that be good? That would be a good start, right? And then when we do get off track, not staying off track as long. Correcting it quicker, being more aware of it. If we can just do this spiritual audit for complacency and just kind of say, you know, where has culture shaped me more than I've shaped culture? You know, maybe I bought into the fact that at work it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's every man for themself. And you know what? I'm gonna, if I'm going to climb up the ladder, I've got to step on a few folks. Well, that's not what Jesus says. He says we're to go the second mile. He says we're to work unto Him. He says we are to serve others. So maybe you need to make a correction there. Or maybe we take a look at where we've made unhealthy compromises with culture. You know, it, it may be pornography, it may be in financial dealings, it may be with sexual immorality. There's so many ways the enemy can attack us. 
And we say, you know what, I, I believe, but I'm not doing what I believe. I've lost some of that hunger and I want it back. Some of us can remember when we were so intimate with God. We remember the warmth, we remember the trust, we remember what it felt like just to be bathed in His mercy and grace and to hear Him speak to us through the Word and speak to us through His Spirit. And for some of us, perhaps that has slipped away and we want it back. And God is saying, you just need to take the first step. Obey. Get back to doing what you know you should be doing. You know, this, this hunger thing, it comes and goes with people. And I think awareness is so important. I think one of our biggest vulnerabilities is, is the one we're unaware of. And so what I like about actually symbolically having a red belt is if you keep one someplace that just reminds you, you know, stay hungry for God. After this message today, what this ought to say to you when you see it is obey. Do what you know. Do what you know. Learn more about me and then do more of that and do it consistently because this, this symbolizes obedience and this is, this is what will create the hunger. Because as you obey, he'll show himself to you. And that will stir up a hunger to do even more and allow him to do more through you. So I brought one of these for each of you that, that's interested in taking one of these. Uh, there'll be a place where you can grab it and put it a place where it's visible. I don't suggest you throw it in the drawer unless you keep the drawer open all the time. I would keep it in a place where it's present where you can be reminded that am I hungry for God or have I made too many compromises? Am I being obedient? Am I drawing closer to him? You know, just let this... Red belt be as a, a daily reminder to fight off complacency, this calm contentedness, this smug satisfaction with our casual relationship with God. Let the red belt remind you to truly live for God in an obedient manner. And, you know, and not just get into this skim the surface uh, relationship that so many of our Christian lives have been dumbed down to. Let the red belt remind you to stop discussing God and start obeying Him. You know, there comes a time you've got to stop discussing and start deciding and start moving in that direction. We can talk about it and talk about it, or we can start doing it. Let the red belt remind you that there comes a time to stop studying and talking and contemplating and analyzing and debating certain words and passages and just start obeying them. Just start doing what they say. There comes a time when we have to stop sticking our toes in. Let this remind you that these issues maybe that you've been skirting around or afraid to commit to, that, that, that you've got to rise above this, this level of Christianity where all you're doing is sticking your toes in. And you've got to take a plunge and a plunge of faith and a plunge of obedience and get away from this lukewarm Christianity that Jesus himself said makes him want to throw up. Revelation 3, 7, he said, Be hot or be cold, but if you're lukewarm, I want to vomit you out of my mouth. And, and so when he sees this lukewarm going through the motions, knowing it but not doing a type of Christianity, just so you know, we're upsetting his stomach, literally. And we want to get away from that and truly take the plunge and rise above this, this Christianity that so many people go through on a take the low-hanging fruit type of basis and never make themselves available or moldable to be used in the way God could use us, wants to use us, will use us. If we'll just get that hunger back and sustain it and starts with obedience with His Word. I just ask that we would all do this spiritual audit for complacency and make the necessary adjustments and take the red belt and have this new mindset as we leave here. Don't become like the complacent black belt. You know, I'm comfortable with God. I don't think we should be comfortable with God. I think we should love God with all of our heart, but I think he's going to continue to stretch us, and he's going to continue to make us uncomfortable. You know why? He wants us to depend on him. So just the fact that you might be too comfortable with God might be a little wake-up call that maybe I haven't put enough on the line for him to do more through me. And this would be a good step for it. So I hope you like the concept. I hope you uh, will embrace it and make yourself available for God to do more through you as well. Now, we decided to allot some time for questions and answers. If you have uh, any about uh, uh, this topic, I certainly don't have all the answers, but I'll do anything I can to further explain or help what we've talked about here today. Anybody?
Yes, sir. Is there a baby step of obedience? Wait a second. That's a great question. Yeah, I asked, is there a baby step of obedience? Is there like something easy we can obey to like work up to the harder commandments? You know, that's funny. I, sometimes There's such I, a thing? I, sometimes I think that... Uh, the white belt, I mean. The white belt. You got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. You got to start somewhere. I, you know, I've always believed when I've gotten off track with God, and this may not answer your question fully. I can only speak from a personal point of view. But when I've gotten off track from God, and wanted to become more obedient. I needed to go back and do the last thing he told me to do that I didn't do. Go back and do the last thing. Go, go look at the area where I'm off track right now that I know I'm off track and get back on track. Listen to the last word. Maybe he told me to reconcile with somebody. Maybe he told me I needed to pay that money back. Maybe he told me I need to apologize. And every time I read the Bible, that stirs up in me again. And I realize that's God speaking to me and I haven't done it, I haven't done it, I haven't done it. And I wonder why he's not talking to me in these other areas of my life. I really don't have to wonder. I'm not listening to one thing I do here. And so go back and, and do the last right thing you know you should have done, perhaps that you didn't do. That's where I start, and that's where I recommend anybody can start. I like that. I'll, 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 I'll fly with that. Good. That's a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'd just like to know, how do you uh, access yourself under, in under determining your level to commitment to, uh, to, God, uh, to God? Because I think my level of commitment only reaches to level one, uh, that uh, they, I expect him to deliver uh, l deliver something because throughout my uh, throughout a good chunk of my life, I always end up uh, always end up sh uh, falling short of what uh, what I should do because I don't think I could do uh, I could do it, and, ult and ultimately I need I need some sort of help to do it. You know, I think that uh, it's so common. What you're describing is what happens when you count too much on yourself and you're afraid to let go of certain things and you're depending more on yourself than you're depending on God. And so you will be limited as to what you can do for God. You, 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 you'll, your faith will never get exercised. If, if that's the way you're looking at God. And if you're afraid, you know, to, to really step up and to let go of certain things, you gotta, you got to trust Him. Here's what helped me start to believe every word that's in the Bible. I had to ask myself, because let's face it, there's some things in there sometimes we're afraid to do, we're afraid to follow, we're afraid to tithe, we're afraid to go confront that person and, and apologize, we're afraid to forgive because they might hurt us again. Sometimes there's this fear but we have to realize, we have to ask ourselves, is God a liar or not? And I am, for one, believe that God is not a liar. And, and, and believing that God is not going to lie, that He's incapable of lying, makes it a lot easier for me to say, you know what, okay, He says to do it. May not make any sense in my mind, but His ways are higher than mine. I'm going to do it anyway because I trust Him more than I trust me. Trust in me has got me into a miserable place a lot of the time. I've got a lousy track record of where trusting me can bring me. I'm going to try something better. I don't believe He's a liar. I'm going to call Him on His word. I'm going to take Him at His word. I'm going to make that next step and take that next leap of faith and see what happens. That's, that's what I have done. And I recommend maybe some version of that would help you as well. Does that include the free, uh, fear of failure? Because I'm always, more often than not, that's what I always was. Fear of failing? Absolutely. You know, here, here's the thing. When you're trusting God, you, you learn that when you hit a wall, you learn to bounce. You don't splatter. Okay. You bounce. You learn from it. That, that, it, that it goes according to His purposes. That even if you fail, if it's in His will... You're failing for a reason. He wants you to learn from it, become more because of it, position you, maybe humble you, learn something to help you do something greater in the, in the long run. But if you fail and it's not in His will, you know, if you were out of His will and you fail, well, that's the, the natural consequence of not being in His will normally is to have it fail. So, so either way, if that happens, then you get back in His will. Absolutely it addresses, it, it has to do with the fear of failure as well. Thank you, yes, sir. Thank you.
Anybody else? All right, Reverend. I've noticed that um, over the years that, you know, a lot of, and not just in this church, but around wherever I go, a lot of folks go to church on Sunday mornings and they hear the truth about doing it. And you're right, we need to start doing it, not just talk about the Bible, more about God. Uh, what do you say to men and women who would leave church today, for an example, that before next Sunday would have fornicated? Fornicate means to do it without being married, right? Is that right? Yeah? yeah. No? Y'all yeah. scared to ask? <laughs> How would you encourage them to stay away from that? Especially with men, they see that, that one, that's one of the downfall, a major downfall. You know, it, it, it's, it's such a pervasive challenge, and, and it, it, it's, again, trusting God, I believe we do something like that because we think we're going to lose the person if we don't, if we're with somebody. So we fear that rather than trusting God that if that happens, he would bring us a better person, that he's going to have a better relationship for us. Or we are selfish and we want to satisfy more our own lusts and pleasures than we are interested in really serving God. And so you have to decide what's most important. You have a decision to make if that's the situation, all right? Are you going to continue to do what benefits you lust-wise and emotion-wise and pleasure-wise in the short term, but in the long term is going to create a deeper wedge in between you and God, is going to make it harder and harder for you to trust Him and more difficult for Him to do something significant through you. So if that's the case, people got a decision to make. They got to realize what 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 is gonna what am I about and where is this gonna take me in the long run, okay? The, the short term quick fix, or is that what my life's gonna be about? One quick fix after the next quick fix after the next quick fix, patch it up, feel good here for a while, and then feel that emptiness and that separation and never reach my potential. Or am I ready to get serious and take God at His word? And, tell me, and understand that if he's telling me not to do that, there's a reason I shouldn't do that, that he has something better for me. It goes back to a decision. You've got to decide where you're going to be in that area or areas similar to it. Unfortunately, we live in an instant gratification age where, where, where people, it, it's now, I want it now. They, they don't develop the, the, the discipline or the spiritual discipline to build something really substantial for themselves in the long term. And in that instant gratification age, God gets left behind, unfortunately. There's a part two to that. <laughs> then I'll, I'll let you have it. Um, they use this thing where Paul said, the things I don't want to do, I do, and the things I want to do, I can't do, and I realize it's sin. They have used that up. I'm sorry Paul said that, because they now use that as, well, I can't help it. I'm doing something I don't want to do. You know, yeah, they use right. that as an excuse now. They forget Paul also said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. They choose, pick and choose which words of Paul that they, that, that they want to use, and that's the one thing about taking something out of context and spinning it in a way that, that, that sanitizes your own sin. And that's what a lot of Christians have become very good at. They will take something out of context, out of the will of Christ, spin it in order to trivialize, marginalize, sanitize, or rationalize, or compromise their own sin. And they're not, they're not kidding anybody. And they're, they're killing their soul. Um, <clears throat> I've come to realize that the it might be semantics, but when you say make a decision, I've, those have been there. But for me, the biggest ones have been I realized I've had to surrender to God. I mean, I, it wasn't a decision as much as, okay, I, all the things that I've decided to do, nah, i got to surrender. Brother, I think that's the biggest decision is surrendering. I think it is absolutely a, that it is a decision. It's one of the biggest ones. It's letting go. It's what this gentleman here, I, I was trying to find the words, and that's really the words I should have used. You know, you got to surrender. You got to give up to go up in God. There's certain things, certain habits, certain beliefs, certain control that you have to surrender, uh, give up in order to go up. And I absolutely believe that in itself is a decision uh, that, that, that can be a hard one, you know, but has great, great fruit. Yes, sir. 
as a leader and you know you have followers how would you explain the will of god because we know only so much in the plan and what to do how would you explain to the others that are following you that you don't know it all but you know that this is the right way to go how would you explain them to continue to follow you because you're following god well, young man first let me tell you it's great to see you here today i think it's wonderful to see young leaders in a come into a, a room like this and thirsting after God. I, I, I think you say what you just said. You, and I tell people this, and I've written books on the topic. The Reverend Peterson talked, the, you know, how to run your business by the book. That's the Bible, how to lead by the book. I don't have all the answers. And I tell them, listen, take, take some pressure off yourself. I don't have all the answers. This is a journey. God's mind is bigger than my mind, you know. But, but, but this is what I know is the right thing to do and I'm going to do the next right thing. I don't have to have the 10-step plan. I need to know what the next right thing is. And the best way you can communicate that to your followers is to live it. Let them see you doing it. Because people would rather see a sermon than hear one. And they're sick and tired of uh, hearing people talk, talk right about God and then walk left. They're sick of that. And so that, that's what you do. You just tell them exactly what you told me and then you live it out. And those are the kind of followers that you'll get the genuine kind of followers. And let me tell you something. Don't be worried if some of them walk away. They walked away from Jesus too. Okay. They, they left him too. And so you're not going to make, your job's not to make everybody happy by, by, by tickling their ears with all these sweet compromises that they want you to tell them. It's to talk about what's right and to do what's right. And the right people will continue to follow you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You, you mentioned uh, complacency as being um, one of the uh, main um, hunger killers. Uh, can you uh, uh, perhaps give me like a top, uh, top three other than complacency? What other uh, major uh, things uh, uh, kill hunger? That's a great question. Let me tell you, I think complacency actually opens the door for the others. I think if we can avoid complacency, that's the main one. But if we become calmly content and smugly self-satisfied, let me tell you what opens the door to. It opens the door to becoming a know-it-all. Uh, when, you, when you're calmly content and smugly self-satisfied, you start to get this been there, done that attitude. And you stop seeking out new information. You stop listening to feedback that might help you. You defend the way you've always done things. And so turning into a know-it-all, getting this intelligence arrogance, Okay, that eventually turns into a disabling ignorance. Getting that, that, that's a sign. Okay, been there, done that. Can't teach me anything. I know it all. The, the next thing, and, but see, complacency allows that to happen. In my leadership seminars, I, I spend so much time battling complacency because I know if we can draw the line there, these other ones don't start to fall like dominoes. But if we let that one in, then we become a know-it-all. Then another thing we do is we lose our focus. Instead of focusing on the main things, the things that matter most, we live every day a mile wide and an inch deep. Well, what can cause us to live a mile wide and an inch deep? We're calmly content. We're smugly self-satisfied. We're spread thin all over the place. We have lost that intense desire, that compelling craving, that laser-like focus to know this is what we say yes to. This is what we say no to. This is what we engage in. This is what we withdraw from. That's what happens when you lose your focus. You lose your hunger. Ha, ha, when you're out of focus, you can't be hungry. You're just trying to survive. You're, you, when you're a mile wide and an inch deep, you're just trying not to go under. You can't move forward. And the next thing that causes loss of hunger, we stop setting goals that stretch us. Okay, now I, don't think, I don't think you should set goals that you don't believe in your heart you could reach, but you've got to leave some room for God. They've got to stretch you. They've got to get you out of a comfort zone. And, and when we start to have these easy, no-brainer, you know, low-hanging fruit type of goals for ourselves, for our business, for our life, it's really easy to lose the hunger because we're just kind of maintaining things. See, I talked about that why earlier. You know what happens to some people as they go up in life, as they get more successful? They scratch a lot of the stuff off their list. Some people, they're living in the house that was once their why. They're driving the car that was once their why. Their kids are going to the school that was once their why. They're making the money that was once their why. So as you scratch these things off and you don't set new goals that stretch you, and I believe the most significant hunger goals are goals not just for material things, but for making a difference. 
you know, my, my, my why's changed a lot over the years, and most people's has, so you need to continue to set goals that stretch you, continue to work on yourself so you don't become a know-it-all, and continue to obey God so that hunger for Him increases and you don't become complacent in the first place. Those would be some other things I would watch out for if I were you. And we are down to our last 15 seconds. These are wonderful questions. Hey, you don't have any questions? You're so smart. <laughs> That's why they don't have any questions. <laughs> they already know. They know. Thank you all very much. I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. And the red, the red belts will be out around the corner on the table for you. You're welcome to grab one if you like one. Did you enjoy that? Was it helpful? I knew you would love it. Uh, Dave and his wife, the foundation, donated some books to us. And one day I was sitting in my office and I decided to just read through them. I'm like, wow. And, and I don't like to read that much, Dave. I, I, I read the stuff I like. Yes. And the book, it, reading your book just caused me to realize I had to share you with folks around here. Thank you. So thank you and your family for coming today. Thank you for I, having me. Absolutely appreciate it. Our pleasure. Yes, sir. Um, when you were speaking of the different belts, the white belt, red belt, yellow belt, and then the black belt, right? The black belt is the best one, right? Yes, sir. I have a friend who went all the way to the black belt. And so one day I was over to his house. He had all of his belts in the drawer, you know, and he's pulling them out, bragging. <laughs> oh, look at my yellow belt, my white belt, my black belt. <laughs> and he finished the black belt, and once he got the black belt, he stopped going. Just as you said, and then he got fat. <laughs> and, so, and so recently, this is a true story, too. I, I'm not making this up. Recently, he went back to the class, maybe after a year or two, give or take. And so I asked, I said, how was your class? Oh, it was so hard. I got hard to do it. Isn't that right, Frankie? Oh, I'm not talking about Francis. <laughs> He did the, black, the whole belt thing and stopped doing it. So you're absolutely right to what you said about that. Thank absolutely you. right. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, that's why you got to stick with things. Yes, sir. You have to stick with it. Uh, one other thing you said that I, I like, oh, about doing. You know, we read about the Bible. We have church about the Bible. We pray about God and we talk about him. But if you don't do it, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. It's doing. As a matter of fact, God says, be slow to speak, quick to hear, but you got to do it. You got to do it. A lot of folks say, oh, I don't go out and get active. I don't protest. Or I don't do this. I, I just pray because the end is coming anyway. I'm like, are you crazy? God said, great is he that's in us and he that's in the world. We have the power over evil, and all you're going to do is sit back and pray. That doesn't make sense, but that's how the devil deceives us. How do you know you have power if you don't stand up against evil? You know, if you're not doers and being that shining light. So, right on, man. Thank that was something else coming from a white man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, we're building a solid foundation this year, and it, and. It, and I'm going to do my best to help get this done. You know, I'm going to bring the speakers to you and uh, teach you how to pray or whatever. But we are losing our families. We are losing our country. We are losing our friendships. We are losing marriage, husbands and wives. Relationships don't last that long because the foundation, the spiritual foundation is not being built. That's why we have, get, we have gotten away from it from the, for the most part. And so I'm committed to helping get back to that, all right? I want to thank you for coming. Uh, next week, next Sunday, um, I'm going to deal with something that I haven't heard about lately from most people. And I travel around the country, and I haven't heard about this, and that is the Holy Spirit. Have anybody heard about the Holy Spirit lately? I forgot all about him. I don't even hear anybody talking about him. He still exists. And so I have three things I want you to think on 
this week. First is, uh, are we born with the Holy Spirit? Anybody know? First, do you know what it is? Who don't know what it is? Only one person don't know. That means everybody else does know that, right? All right. Everybody else does. So, what is the whole, let's go to the blue shirt here. You know what it is, right? Oh, John, come over here with your mic. Right, he doesn't have one. This is so important. If you don't understand this, it's going to be difficult. What is the Holy Spirit? It's the guiding spirit inside of you. The guiding spirit inside of you. Okay, how many people agree with that? Don't be scared. We're fellowshipping. In this few minutes we have left. Why y'all uh? How many people agree? You do? Uh, Mark, what is the guidance spirit? What does he mean by that? Well, the Holy Spirit, um, it's within us. It, it guides <laughs> us. It, it can take over me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes? Yeah, so I mean. It, it ta- what do you say, take over you sometimes? What do you mean? Well, I, I'm just saying that... Um, I, I've needed help, God's help, and I didn't know what to do, and all of a sudden the answer was in front of me, and I, I it just led me on my way, and I was fine. Oh, okay. All right. In many instances. <laughs> so so he doesn't work with you all always? Um, well, I know it's always there, but I'm not always um, aware that it's there sometimes, and I have to come back to the moment to... To realize that that's where it is again, okay. to, to seek the guiding spirit. This is so important. I remember uh, when Jesus got ready to return back to the Father, he said to them, to the disciples, I'm going to go back. I got to go back to the Father, but I'm going to send you the Spirit. The Father will send you the Holy Spirit. And when he sent the Spirit back to them, that's when they became powerful. You know, that's when things really started to change. As a matter of fact, according to the scriptures, when he sent the spirit back to them, then even that spirit washed away all of their sins. And they had the power of God working with them. And so, you know, uh, reminded what Dave was saying there, reminded what he, what he was talking about, this sin thing is really holding you back, folks. I was... Just kind of thinking out loud on Saturday, I'm like, how come we are not winning? You know, why are we losing? There are more men and women who say that they believe in God than those who don't believe in him. Why are we winning? And I realized for some reason, what I guess God caused me to realize is because most, most people who say they believe in God are still sinning. And if you're still sinning, you're not going to win. As they said, if you're not doing what the, what God said, you're not going to win this thing. And that's what's happened. Even when they got when they when when they were hanging out with Moses before was that Moses want to take folk over to the Promised Land? They had to wait forty days. Is that right? Forty years before they could go to the Promised Land because he wasn't going to send us over there. So you got to start doing what he said. You got to start doing. And not just preaching about it. Um, Patrick, are we born with the Holy Spirit? Patrick is the smartest white man on this side of heaven. No. He's the behind the headline guy. We're not born with it? No. Why do you say no? Well, that's what Jesus said, that he would bring the Holy Spirit to us when he left. Um, but okay. I, don't, I don't believe we're born with it. Do you have it? Yeah. You have the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Oh, okay. And you say no right here? Yeah. You say no, we're not born with it? Take the mic, I'm sorry. I don't believe we're born with it. You do not believe we're born with it. Why not? Because at that point, we we haven't decided that we're going to follow God. Maybe we get it when we're, you know, once we're baptized or once we kind of believe and follow the Lord. But I don't think we're born with the gift of the Holy Spirit. How many people don't think, just a quick show of hand because of time, how many people don't think we're born with it? 
Okay. It's going to be fun next Sunday. I hope it's the Lord's will. Well, uh, the question is, are we born with it? Uh, or do we have to ask for it? How I many those who don't think we're born with, have you asked for it? And have you received it? Yeah? You say yes? Okay. I can't wait for next Sunday. Hurry up time. And uh, the last question is going to be is, what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit has been given a powerful purpose for us. Ain't nobody out here. <laughs> Let's just get this. Yeah, real fast. Right here, John, I'm sorry. The purpose of it. The purpose of the Holy Spirit. Ten years ago, I read a Bible, and I wanted the Holy Spirit. Because the whole, when you receive the Holy Spirit, it's all already in us to me. But when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive love, joy, peace, all these things. And the last one is self-control. And this is what I've been wanting for years and years. I've been working on it. The Holy Spirit. When you who believe in the Holy Spirit, have you heard of the Holy Spirit? Yes. 20, 15 to 20 years. My daughter says, Mother, you, you always say the Holy Spirit. What you, what, you, what you mean about that? I said, because when you have the Holy Spirit, God put these fruits in you. And that's why I believe in the Holy Spirit. Okay. Well, we're going to deal with that next Sunday as well. What is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? It's amazing how that God loves us so much. His grace is good. He loves us that he has equipped us to have a life on this earth. But most of Christians are not acting as though they've been in, in, equipped for that life. And so we're going we're gonna to deal with that next Sunday. And now that I've mentioned it, I want you to pray about it, focus on it, and realize if you have it or not. All right? Because if you have it, you would know it. You really would know it without a doubt. You would know you have it. And God said, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So we need to start living like that. And as Dave said, you got to start doing it. Doing it. It's not enough to walk out of the meeting and then before you can get home, you on your internet doing whatever you're doing in that. You know, you're right back in. You're, it's, it's just crazy. It's, it's insane to live that way. We got to turn back to God or we're going to lose, we're going to lose this country. Because we have nothing to fight with. You can't fight Satan with Satan. And our battle is a spiritual battle between good and evil, right versus wrong. So we need good to be working through us in order for this to happen, all right? So the Holy Spirit, what is it? Are we born with it? Do we need to ask for it? What is the purpose of it for next week? Did you have a quick question? I just want to ask, uh, is the Holy Spirit that guides you to do the right thing? Even when you know that you have something that you have to do and uh, you sort of don't want to do it because you have fear of what they're going to say to you or you're not, you know. Oh, you mean like if you have to confront someone or. Yeah, and, and tell them the truth. And uh, because I had to do that with my daughter the uh, other day, mm -hmm. I had to advise her of things that uh, was happening. Yeah. And I hadn't been able to do it before because I was uh, sort of afraid that, I think uh, it, it's a fear of losing uh, their acceptance of me. Yeah, let me just say this because I have about a half a minute left. Um, the first thing we have to do first is to seek God in his right way and all things to be added. But you need to forgive, make sure you don't have any resentment in your heart at right. all. You need that perfect love right. to work through you because with perfect love, there is no fear. Well, and so I, if, you, if you have that, you would not have the fear to deal with anything. Well, after I approached her, I, all that fear went away. Good, just, yeah. Because oh. Satan will try and tell you, oh, don't do it. He could put fear in you if you believe him. I thought she was going to be mad at me, but she wasn't. Yeah. I want to thank you for that. Thank you so much for tuning in today, folks. And um, uh, we need your financial support. We have a lot of work to be done uh, be sure to uh, remember us with your tithing and offering. 
And we have some more great speakers coming up for you as we move forward this year. I want to encourage you to pray. Seek first the kingdom of God in his right way so that things will be added. It's all with us. God is with us. He loves us. But you got to start doing. You got to show love. You got to be honest. You got to live upright. You have to be righteous in order that God may work through you. All right? So thank you. And thank you again for showing up. And uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. My pleasure. That is something else. Thank you very much. For more information, to purchase a copy of this program or to make a donation, visit us on the web at bondinfo.org or call 1-800-411-2663. That's 1-800-411-BOND. You're already home.